seedlings, welcome back to my channel. It's Madison here, or Dandelion, and today we are doing another deity spotlight. And as usual, this deity spotlight topic was chosen by my channel members. So if you want to be able to vote in the polls that go up on the community tab of my channel here on YouTube that decide what deity we're going to spotlight next, then hit that join button below this video to become a member of my channel. And the deity chosen by my channel members was Hathor the ancient Egyptian goddess of beauty, sensuality, and maternity. And before we get further into the video, little disclaimer, this video is not for kids. This video is for adults over 18. <laughs> so that being said, let's jump right into information about Hathor. So first let's talk about Hathor's connections to the other deities within the ancient Egyptian pantheon. Hathor is mother to Horus, the god of the sky, and Ra, the god of the sun. And if you know anything about ancient Egyptian mythology, you'll know just from that information that Hathor is a powerful goddess. Horus and Ra are both very important deities within the ancient Egyptian pantheon, very powerful deities. Like we said, they're the sky and the sun. Ra, in a lot of mythology within ancient Egypt, is seen as the creator of all the ancient Egyptian deities. So for Hathor to be Ra and Horus's mother is a big deal. She created those guys. So she's really, really important and powerful. And Hathor was often referred to as the Eye of Ra or the Eye of Atum. And sometimes she's depicted, Grudy scratching, Gretel's doing a scratch. And sometimes she's depicted with a sun disc in her crown. So that sun disc often represents an eye from which the sun is born each day. And Hathor's name means House of Horus. And this refers to a myth in which Hathor stood on the earth as a cow in her cow form. Hathor often comes through as a cow or as a woman with the head of a cow. But in this myth, Hathor stands on the earth in her cow form so that her four legs became pillars holding up the sky and her belly, the base of her belly, became representative of the heavens. So as we said, Hathor is often depicted as a woman with the head of a cow or completely in, a, in the form of a cow. Sometimes Hathor is depicted wearing a headdress of cow horns with a sun disc between them. Sometimes Hathor can also be depicted as a lioness. And it's important to know that Hathor was worshipped with throughout ancient Egypt but also throughout Nubia. The earliest signs of worship of Hathor in ancient Egypt are from the Old Kingdom, which is the earliest period in ancient Egyptian history. And this is around 2300 BC. Hathor was often associated with royalty, and sometimes pharaohs would be depicted as suckling from Hathor's breast. And again, this all connects back to Hathor being the mother of Ra and Horus and all pharaohs. And Hathor was worshipped throughout Nubia because when ancient Egypt conquered Nubia, they brought their pantheon with them. The ancient Egyptian pantheon, of course, came with them to Nubia. And the Nubians were a farming people, so they really naturally gravitated toward the, a deity like Hathor, who was a cow, represent representative of a cow. So they really connected with her and her energy. One big part of worship of Hathor back then and now is cosmetics, adornment, beauty, appreciation of beauty, taking care of yourself, you know, so the act of putting on makeup, the act of styling your hair, the act of getting dressed, the act of putting on jewelry, these are all very strong ways to honor and worship Hathor. Devotees of Hathor see a lot of importance in the appreciation of beauty and the appreciation and expression of sensuality. And there is this scholar of ancient Egyptian and Nubian culture and religion named Solange Ashby. And they have a few quotes that I think are just perfect for Hathor, so I'm gonna read a few. One thing that they said was that Hathor worship could be described as an ancient Egyptian rave. And I just think that is so hilarious and amazing. And the reason that they say this is because worship of Hathor in ancient Egypt 
often did look like a, a spiritually minded party. So this would involve dancing, singing, playing instruments, expression of se sensuality and sexuality, fill in the blank, adults that are watching. Also drinking alcohol, drunkenness, both physically and spiritually. So not just drunkenness through alcohol, but spiritual drunkenness. So this kind of partying, I guess you could say, with all this dancing and singing and music was the main way to worship Hathor. And these kind of ancient Egyptian raves would go on at temples of Hathor. And this is another quote from Solange Ashby, telling us a little bit more of what was included in these rituals. Lighting torches, men playing drums, and women playing double-headed flutes and rattles. Those are the most popular uh, instruments that are known for worshipping specifically Hathor. The women would be singing and clapping. Some young women can be seen dancing scantily clad, doing backbends adorned with jewelry. So this is the kind of Hathor energy we're working with. And again, this is for adults, but that being said, one mythological story of Hathor that again gives you a good idea of who she is and what she represents is there's a story where Ra is feeling really down, he's feeling really glum, he's really feeling really, you know, just low and not happy. And to cheer him up, Hathor shows Ra her vulva. Um, and you know, it's th this is a little complicated because she's supposed to be his mom. But again, remember, like, with all these pantheons, Greek, Roman, Egyptian, you know, pretty much every pantheon across the whole world, there's a little bit of strange um, familial stuff going on in a, <laughs> in a sexual way. Um, but one thing that is also important to know with this type of story where Hathor shows her vulva to another being, in this case, Ra, to cheer them up, is it's not necessarily sexual. Um, you know, we live in a society today, our modern society, where any kind of body part, any kind of, you know, even a, a breast, a nipple, you know, is seen as overtly sexual. And is, you know, just a woman's body fully clothed in our society is seen as overtly sexual. So I think it's important to remember that these ancient Egyptians, this culture of ancient Egypt, did not view the human body as inherently sexual and did not view sexuality as something that was taboo or something that should be hidden away in the shadows. So one thing that existed within ancient Egyptian culture is that exposing the genitals or exposing the private parts of yourself could be seen as comedy. And I know we're... um. You know, we're, we're towing the line, especially when we think about the society we come from, where, you know, exposing yourself is incredibly inappropriate. Of course, that is true permanently, always, forever. Um, you know, if someone doesn't want to see that, they don't want to see that. And you forcing that on them is not cool. But there would be shows in ancient Egypt where a performer would expose their genitalia or whatever, and it was seen as a funny joke or it was seen as lighthearted, or it was, a scene, uh, it was seen as a way of expressing themselves. So it's important to note that with a story like this. It's not necessarily like Hathor was like, hey, look at this, you know, like raising her eyebrows. She was just like, ha, you know, like, it's, it's a way to lighten the mood and show that everything's, everything's good, everything's cool, everything's chill. Um, and it kind of reminds me too of, and we're getting a little off topic here, but just a quick little digression that's related. Um, it reminds me too of the bonobos. You know, we're very genetically connected to the bonobos. And if you don't know about the bonobo, definitely look it up and research it. It's very interesting. But bonobos are very sexual beings. They're beings that will diffuse tension with sensuality. And again, it won't always go all the way to sex and intercourse. It'll just stay at hey, look at this, and that diffuses the tension. So we're kind of dealing with that same kind of thing here. So you have to kind of leave your modern day beliefs behind and put yourself in the mindset of these ancient Egyptians. So again, here is a quote from the scholar Ashby. Ancient Egyptian religion and even their hieroglyphic writing system was full of explicit sexuality and depictions of sexual body parts. And this, again, this is very similar to other pantheons, especially ancient Greece. There was a practice in ancient Greece called anasurma, and forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. And this was what I described, exposing the genitals as a form of humor. It's also important to note that Hathor was popular among royalty and kind of associated with royalty, but she was also popular among all the classes, 
all the genders. It wasn't just women, it wasn't just men, it wasn't just rich, it wasn't just poor. And knowing this, knowing how important she was and the status she had within the, within the ancient Egyptian pantheon, we wonder to ourselves, I know I was wondering this as I first started learning about Hathor, why isn't she more popular today? Why don't we hear about her more today? Why do most people, when they think about the most important goddess of ancient Egypt, why do they think of Isis instead of Hathor? And this also has to do, again, with the connection between ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. So all of our information, inevitably, comes from Greco-Roman sources. So Isis was brought to Greece and Rome in later periods. So more closely connected to the time we live in now, Isis was brought to Greece. Unlike the earlier Hathor, like we talked about, Hathor goes all the way back to the old kingdom of ancient Egypt. So Hathor is a very old deity. So it's harder to get accurate information on her. It's harder to, you know, necessarily remember her as the generations go on. And then Isis gets taken to Greece and then she becomes popular in ancient Greece, in ancient Egypt. And Hathor kind of gets not forgotten, but kind of absorbed almost into Isis in some ways. And we see this in the worship of Isis in those later periods in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. The worship of Isis kind of becomes similar to the worship of Hathor with these ancient Egyptian raves that we talked about previously being honoring Isis. But that's kind of how we always honored Hathor. So you could argue that while we're calling Isis Isis, there might not be so much of a strong divide between Isis and Hathor. They might be kind of interwoven. So when the ancient Greeks conquered ancient Egypt around 300 BC, all this starts to happen. You know, the pantheons start to merge. Ancient Egyptian knowledge goes to ancient Greece. Ancient Greece knowledge goes to ancient Egypt. And a lot of the iconography of Isis shows us again that merging, that blurry line between Hathor and Isis. And particularly when we're talking about this, we're talking mostly about the sistrum rattle and the headdress. Remember we said that Hathor is often depicted wearing a headdress of cow horns with a sun disc in the center. And we also said that the sistrum rattle was one of the biggest associations in terms of musical instruments when it came to worshiping Hathor. So now we see the sistrum rattle being used to worship Isis, where it used to be worship, used to worship Hathor. So you could argue that just because Hathor's name fell away as history went on, you could argue that she continued to be worshipped through the worship of Isis, which I think is really beautiful. So now that we know who Hathor is, what she represents, her history, let's talk about how we can work with Hathor. So as we said already, one of the biggest ways you can worship and honor Hathor is through self-adornment. So makeup hairstyling, hair accessories, jewelry. Jewelry is a really big one. You can get jewelry that specifically has an image of Hathor on it or has a symbol of Hathor on it or just any jewelry at all. All jewelry can be connected back to Hathor because she has that strong appreciation of beauty and adornment. Also cosmetics and makeup, big, big connection to Hathor. So you could say that every single morning when you put on your makeup or when you get ready for your day, even if it's the smallest amount of makeup, you're honoring Hathor in that process. And you can make that more of a ritual if you are a Hathor worshiper. The act of appreciating beauty, huge for Hathor. So even if you're going throughout your day and you notice something beautiful, stop and appreciate it, no matter what it is. Take a moment to really be present with that beauty. Hathor would love that. Also, like we said before, these, you know, bring back to life in whatever way you can, these ancient Egyptian raves. So sing, dance, play instruments if you're able, chant. You know, if you follow me on my channel and you're familiar with me, you'll know that ecstatic dance is huge for me. I lead ecstatic dances. I have my own personal, private, solitary ecstatic dance practice. I think it's one of the most beautiful ways to worship and honor, honestly, anything. But Hathor, in particular, loves dancing, especially ecstatic dance. So put on some music, dance around, keep that spirit of Hathor in your mind, invite her to witness your dance and your ritual, and she will be very grateful for it, and she will honor you in return. And another way, another big way to honor Hathor, because she's such a deity of sensuality and sexuality, is to perform consensual acts 
of sexual expression. So you can do this by yourself, you know, express your sexuality by yourself in honor of Hathor. Or you can, if you have a partner that is down to do kind of sex magic with you, you can invite them into that ritual space with you and you guys can do that together to honor Hathor. That is a very strong and powerful way to honor Hathor. So let's talk about some correspondences of Hathor so that you're ready to go on your journey with Hathor. The colors associated with Hathor are red and gold, which I absolutely love because those feel really rich and strong and powerful and sensual and sexual and kind of flirty almost. So gold and red together are very strong representations of Hathor. The animals she's associated with, biggest one is the cow. So the number one animal she's associated with is the cow. She's also associated with the lion. So sometimes she's depicted as a lion. And then the third animal she's associated with sometimes is the cobra. And when Hathor is in her cobra form, it's seen to be a protective version of Hathor. So it's kind of seen as divine protection. Hathor is also strongly associated with the sycamore tree. So if you have access to a sycamore tree, it can be an excellent place to leave offering for Hathor, to worship Hathor, to communicate with Hathor, reach out to Hathor, ask her to communicate back to you while you sit at the base of that tree. Hathor was also known as the lady of the sycamore. And Hathor actually, in some stories, appears in funerary rites, during funerary rites, to give nourishment to the dead from the sycamore tree, giving them this milk of the sycamore tree. Okay, that is all about the goddess Hathor. I hope you enjoyed this video and you got something out of it. You feel like you know everything you need to know to get started with Hathor or reignite your experience with Hathor. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my future videos. And remember, you can hit that join button to become a member of my channel and vote on what deity we're gonna spotlight next. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon. Blessed be.